The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled Harnessing Innovation in Bladder Cancer Care, Strategies for Effectively Implementing Modern Therapeutic Advances Across the Disease Continuum. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash DME860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Okay, uh, good morning everyone and uh, to all of our, our viewers online. Uh, a big hello and greeting from AUA 2024 here in San Antonio, Texas. Uh, we're really looking forward to this presentation today. As you can see, the title, Harnessing Innovation in Bladder Cancer Care. Um, this is a great time to be in bladder cancer. And that's what we're gonna hopefully get across today with my, my good friends and colleagues, Josh Meeks and Ashish Kamat. Uh, there's so many things that are happening in bladder cancer now that it's, it's almost unbelievable compared to where we were 10 years ago. I think things really started taking off in 2016 with the advent of the checkpoint inhibitors, and now there's just multiple improvements in diagnostics, in imaging, and most importantly, therapeutics. So how do we think about um, addressing that? How do we make ourselves better? Uh, one of the themes is you know, the specialization for bladder cancer and having an advanced bladder cancer clinic. Uh, here are my colleagues, uh, you know, Ashish Kamat and Josh Meeks, uh, from MD Anderson and Northwestern, um, uh, pillars of academic research and education. I'm at Carolina Urologic Research Center. So what are our goals for today? Uh, I've already talked about it, but we're gonna really have three important um, stages of bladder cancer, and they're quite gargantuan, really, uh, in and of themselves. Non-muscle invasive bladder cancer, bladder sparing, trimodal bladder sparing options, and then uh, metastatic urethelial carcinoma, and what do we do with that? And I want you to be thinking about how you're incorporating this into your clinic, whether you're in the US, outside the US, uh, whether you're community, metropolitan, urban, or in a tertiary academic center, and how are you thinking on optimizing the multidisciplinary team? I mentioned Beacon. Um, this is an amazing organization that has, and you can read through this over here, their uh, ability to deliver resources for patient support and caregivers uh, when it's, you know, people get the diagnosis of cancer, that you know, dreaded C word, uh, they are uh, remarkably comforting and are always curating and updating their resources. And they're obviously, this is a 501c3 nonprofit organization. A lot of energy is in Beacon is, is an, uh, um, on funding cutting edge research as well. So what are some of the unmet needs in the treatment of NMIBC and, and muscle invasive bladder cancer? Um, we have BCG shortages, clearly in the US, maybe not so in some of our, uh, our, our colleagues here visiting and, and watching online outside the US. We've been struggling with that. We've had, we'll talk perhaps a little bit more about that. Uh, additionally, uh, issues that uh, 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 patients are not getting access to care of really the uh, level one evidence when they have muscle invasive bladder cancer and how can we do better? Because the biology is generally extremely aggressive for these patients. Uh, and then we're gonna talk about um, you know, health reported quality of life assessments. How can we think about adjuvant strategies, even neoadjuvant strategies, bladder sparing strategies? And ultimately at the end of the day, uh, we, when it comes to all forms, we want to you know, be curative, we want to decrease the risk of recurrence in NMIBC and certainly of progression. Um, numerous FDA approved agents, and if you look at it now, um, I, I, you know, we have three in the US, we have three FDA um, uh, BCG unresponsive CIS agents approved in the last couple of years. Pretty amazing. We have four to five different mechanisms of action uh, um, um, and more than that, the, uh, drugs that are commercially available for our patients with adjuvant and metastatic uh, urethelial cancer. So rather incredible what's happening, and how do you keep up with it? In addition to testing, biomarkers, we'll talk a little bit about that as well, where that's going, um, and then of course is adverse event management. And I'm always a, been a, a big proponent that 
especially for your oncologists, that we cannot let that be an impediment to adoption. And we need to always be learning about new and unique adverse um, uh, events of interest. So with that, it's my pleasure to turn over our first um, session on NMIBC. So much going on to uh, Ashish Kumar. Thanks, Neil. And uh, I have to echo what you said about Beacon and the support for our patients and Bladder Cancer Awareness Month in May. I also want to just acknowledge and, and recognize all of you in the audience. I mean, the fact that you're here bright and early when there's so much else going on, showing your support for bladder cancer is, is truly heartwarming because, you know, they're not that recently was not that much going on in bladder cancer, but this is really wonderful to see. So, you know, with the topic about utilizing therapeutic innovations for non-Muslim invasive bladder cancer, as you all know in the audience, we could spend a whole day on this. We don't want to do that, so we thought we'd focus on high-risk non-Muslim invasive bladder cancer, because that's truly where a lot of the activity is going on, and a lot of the agents from that space have now moved into other spaces. They moved into intermediate risk and also into the lower risk categories. So first off, it's very, very important to sort of level set and set the stage for what do we mean when we talk about the different categories of bladder cancer. And the different guidelines from the AUA, EAU, et cetera, do a really good job with putting down the different risk categories. But in the clinic, when we're looking at patients, we like to think of them in ways in which we can actually talk to them, counsel them in ways that matter to the patient and their families. And for that reason, most of us that take care of patients with bladder cancer will consider high grade, doesn't matter if it's TA, T1, CIS, any high grade tumor is considered high risk because those patients have not just a chance of recurrence, which even the lower risk and intermediate risk patients do, but a chance of progression. And progression is that endpoint that truly makes a difference to our patients' lives because the tumor progresses, then you have to go on to either trimodal or cystectomy or, God forbid, metastatic paradigm. So high grade, high risk, keep that in mind. Now, it doesn't matter which guideline you look at, whether it's CITC, AUA, IBCG, NCCN, EAU, whatever, just take any guideline. Even today in 2024, the standard treatment for high-risk non-Muslim with bladder cancer is BCG immunotherapy. But as Dr. Shore alluded to, in North America at least, there's still an ongoing relative shortage of BCG. Might not be the case in the rest of the world, but the standard treatment and the best, most effective treatment today is still immunotherapy with intravesical BCG. But BCG doesn't work in all patients, and patients often develop recurrences, but also sometimes progression. And because of that, we need to think of these tumors that recur in different categories. The BCG refractory category is essentially a tumor that's never responded to BCG. Relapsing is when it's gone away and it's come back. Intolerant is more a reflection of the fact that the treatment is too toxic for the patient and the patient can't tolerate BCG. But putting these nuances together in, rec in making recommendations to the FDA, the term BCG unresponsive was coined. So what is BCG unresponsive disease? For a patient or a tumor to be considered BCG unresponsive, you have to have delivered adequate BCG, which is at least one induction and one maintenance course. And then the tumor should be recurrent if it's um, CIS within 12 months, if it's papillary tumors within six months, and if it's T1 disease, because clearly those are at very high risk, that can be at the first look at the cystoscopy. So that's considered BCG unresponsive. I do want to emphasize to everyone in this room that probably knows this already, it's not a clinical definition. It's not a definition that was ever meant to be used to make clinical treatment recommendations. There are some patients in whom a little more BCG might work. There are many in whom it may not. But this was a definition that was used to inform the clinical trials that we'll show you in a little bit. So the first drug off the block that used this paradigm of BCG unresponsive disease did a very thorough evaluation, a good clinical study, and was presented to the FDA and was approved was pembrolizumab. And most of you here are very familiar with this, this uh, Kaplan marker. It's been shown many times, but I do want to show it again and emphasize that it's not just the CR rate that surprised many of us, to be honest, for a systemic drug to have a 40% CR in the bladder for CIS, but it was the duration of response, the 16.2 month duration of response, which again fits in with the whole immunotherapy uh, paradigm. But for patients with non muscular nasal disease, this was a great backbone on which a lot of things have now been built. 
Uh, on an extended follow-up of the 39 responders, 33% of men in CR greater than 18 months and about 23% at uh, greater than 24 months. So clearly, based on this and other data, of course, that the FDA looked at in January of 2020, Premolizumab was approved for patients with CIS with a well papillary disease that are classified as being BCG unresponsive. The next drug that was approved in this space is gene therapy, natafarigine. And this essentially was a drug that was developed by Colin Dilley at MD Anderson, and it's a non-replicating adenovirus, essentially that delivers interferon into the bladder and creates a self-propelling uh, bioreactor, so to speak, with high concentration and doses of interferon. Um, Dr. Shore uh, presented this data at ASCO in phase two, and then of course the phase three was, was published. And in the phase three primary analyses, uh, the CR rate was 53% um, at the three month time point, and at 12 months, roughly half of those, 45%, maintained that CR. And again, this was sort of similar to the data that you see with pemerlizumab at 12 months, roughly in that 20% range. And based on this data, and of course other data that they look at, the FDA approved at Stiladrin, as the uh, uh, trade name is called, but natafarigine, in December of 2022. This is 36-month efficacy data that was presented recently um, at multiple venues. This shows what happens when the patients are followed longer term. You can see that on the panel, I don't know if the mouse works. Yeah, it does. So on the panel here, that's that 24% that I talked about at 12 months. And at 24 months, so at two years, it was still in that 20% range, 19%. Uh, and of course, at three years, you would expect it to drop, and it certainly did, getting down into the low teens. But these are the numbers that really matter to our patients, right? The patients don't care what happens at three months, 50%, that's great. They really care about these numbers. What's my chance of being free of disease at a year, at two years? And for the most part, um, we quote them the numbers between 20 and 25% for um, uh, natafarigine and also for pemerlizumab. There are other studies that are ongoing using um, um, natafarigine. It, it is, the, the, the trade name is Estrilodrin, um, and the uh, uh, trials are based on Estrilodrin in bladder cancer, so ABLE trials. Phase two studies essentially is natafarigine plus or minus chemo, uh, plus or minus uh, pemerlizumab in patients with BCG unresponsive disease. ABLE 32 is essentially looking at the safety and efficacy of natafarigine versus observation in intermediate risk bladder cancer, which is not really the topic of much of what we're gonna talk about today. And then of course we have prospective registries and other trials that are using natafarigine in, in different forms and, and ways. Of course there are other gene therapies, right? And, and the one that's gaining a lot of uh, uh, recognition because of the data that's coming out um, is the oncolytic virus uh, credostimogene. Um, it's um, um, also known as CG0070. And this is a adenovirus-based oncolytic vaccine, expresses GMCSF, and then replicates very selectively in tumor cells that have mutated or deficient RB gene. Now, it's not just a direct cell kill, but there's also a harnessing of the immune um, um, pathway. And the administration of this drug, as opposed to uh, natafarigine, which is once every three months, this drug is given similar to BCG. So it's once a week for six weeks, and then there's maintenance with patients who don't respond at, after the first six weeks, uh, given the chance of a reinduction with six weeks of therapy. So it's more intensive therapy than natafarigine, but the results are what they are with the intensive therapy, and they're, again, very impressive. So CR at any point is 75%. And if you look at that drop-off, you expect a steeper drop-off. May not be so much because they're getting that reinduction, but the three and six months CR is 68, 63%, again, which is higher than what we've seen with agents that I showed you previously. And you can see the swimmer sprout to the right of the screen there, again, showing that a lot of patients maintain this, this uh, CR and are doing really well. There is going to be an update to this uh, presented actually today by Mark Tyson. So look at your schedules and go and attend it. They're going to uh, give updated results that obviously we can't share here. Um, the IL-15 super agonist, uh, NAI is what I'll call it. It has a long name that I just can't pronounce, but it's the IL-15 agonist, also known as NA-3 or NAI for short, uh, just got approved a few days ago by the FDA. And this is essentially a IL-15 super agonist that activates multiple things in the bladder, but the predominant thing is it activates cold tumors to become hot with the MHC1 complex, and it also recruits via the IL-15 uh, binding natural killer cells to then target 
cancer cells and kill them. And of course, it's given with BCG because it needs something to create that cascade and have those tumors lose and or gain the MHC1, MH2, MHC2 complexes based on what the tumor cell is. But it's given with BCG. So again, it's given with BCG, it's once a week for six weeks, and then there's a maintenance therapy built in. And these are results that were published these are not the results that were released in the FDA press release that led to its approval because those numbers are slightly lower N of patients. But similar CR rates, um, that was 68%. This is 71% at any time in the New England Journal uh, publication. And the duration of response, right? Again, it's that duration of response with immunotherapy that is really, really what drives our excitement on behalf of our patients. So 26.6 months, median duration of response, 12 months, 62% CR, and at 24 months, greater than 50, so 53% CR. So really, again, great data for our patients, great that they have more choices. This was just approved, and um, we don't know when it will be available, but should be available shortly. There is going to be an update presented again on this data um, throughout the AUA. There's stuff going on today, but on Sunday, Bobby Reddy will actually present updated data formally uh, for this agent. Um, there have been other advances in the bladder cancer space in the chemotherapy regimen. So for many years, we've used and tried chemotherapy in an intravesical formulation with not much success, some success, obviously, but combination chemotherapy is, is uh, really on the forefront and new ways to deliver chemotherapy. So the TAR-200 is actually just a silicone device and gemcitabine is put in this device. It's instilled in the bladder. It releases gemcitabine at a slow, constant dose. And those of you that might be familiar with the pancreatic cancer literature recognize metronomic gemcitabine really activates the immune cascade. And then you have direct cell kill and also activation of the immune cascade. This is Sunrise 1, which essentially was TAR-200 plus citrilumab, TAR-200 and citrilumab in different uh, arms. The citrilumab arms were closed because the results with TAR-200 alone were so impressive. And this, again, is based on relatively small numbers, but CR rates in the 76% range, duration of response essentially lasting for a long time. Again, these are small numbers, and we want to see what happens when the numbers are expanded. But really exciting results with single-agent TAR-200, which is why the citrilumab arm was closed, because it didn't really seem like it would add much, and systemic drugs obviously have toxicity. This is Sunrise 3, which is the BCG naive high risk non muscle invasive bladder cancer. As I mentioned earlier, we're talking about the high risk and the BCG unresponsive. And these, this is an example of a drug that's come from the unresponsive to the high risk naive space. This is TAR 200 again with citrilumab alone and going head to head against BCG. The results are not available uh, for release yet but we're all expecting um, uh, to hear from them shortly. This is the portfolio of the Sunrise study, um, just for completeness sake. I just wanted to highlight that a lot of these are gonna be reported at this AUA, so just if you wanna look up there and see when and where you could actually hear updated results. Sunrise 3, as I mentioned, is gonna be reported out by Sam Chang on Sunday um, at the AUA, and then updates on Sunrise 1, Sunrise 2, and Sunrise 5 happening at the AUA this year. Not to leave uh, out targeted therapies, so we all recognize the importance of FGR mutations in bladder cancer. It's more frequently mutated in the lower grade patients, so that necessarily means low risk and intermediate risk, but there are selected higher risk patients in the non-muscle invasive paradigm that have mutated, activated FGR pathway, and it's appropriate to study drugs in this space. Um, so in systemic therapy delivery, and the THOR2 study, which, which I don't want to show here, but just mentioned, it was given orally, a lot of toxicity, and was closed prematurely, but there wasn't signal of activity. So of course, logically speaking, if you can give this in the bladder, you would avoid systemic toxicity, and that's where the TAR sort of delivery uh, vehicle comes in. So TAR210 is that same device that I showed earlier, but now it has ertifinimib and it's delivered intravesically in the bladder. So this is the study with two cohorts of patients and on here is showing you cohort one, which is high risk non muscle invasive bladder cancer. And in cohort three is the intermediate risk non muscle invasive bladder cancer and looking at the results with this intravesical ertifinimib. 
So again, small numbers of patients. This was presented at um, ESMO. There's going to be an update presented by Lo Roger Lee on um, Sunday. But looking at the small numbers of patients, you can see that in tumors that have this alteration, um, there is clearly a signal of activity, and there's an excitement that this might be something that can be used not only in, in the higher risk patients, but might be very appropriate for patients that are low grade, because that's where you'd see more of these pathways being altered. And that's the intermediate risk bladder cancer patients, where you can see that the CR was 87%, similar to the small number of patients here, but again, 82%. So with that, Neil? Okay, that was a great overview. We, uh, I. Uh, you have the ability to ask questions, uh, as does the virtual audience. We already have a few questions, and, and uh, one of the questions is, is it will be subsumed under this case presentation. So just before we get to that, um, so here's a question I think is important, uh, Ashish, given the, the role for now uh, a, a, a gene viral therapy approved in the U.S. Um, as of December 2022. Supply chain issues have been now rectified. It has CMS approval, and I'm talking about natofaragene feridenovic. Um, the question is, uh, what does the staff, not only in, a, in an academic center, but also in a community clinic, need to know to effectively integrate gene therapy in their options for patients? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question that we get all the time from folks, right? Is this something that we have to worry about? Is it a gene therapy that we have to, you know, put on the whole bio hood and stuff like that? Um, the short answer is it really depends on your hospital and your clinic's regulations. Um, because we may recommend, and we do this all the time at the AUA and other places, say do it a certain way. But if you go back to your hospital, we found that it really is very different. So, it, uh, uh, for example, at my institution, MD Anderson, it's prepared in pharmacy, it's sent over as a closed loop system, and the nurses in clinic can deliver it with just the same precautions that you have to take for chemo or BCG or whatever. But um, I've had folks just 60 or less miles away where that's not feasible. It has to be done with the bioprotection and et cetera, et cetera. So even though the label insert and what we recommend says that take the normal biological precautions, I would say to whoever asked that question or to anybody, um, ask your hospital because the regulations at your hospital, your clinic will clearly uh, drive what you need to do. Okay. Yeah, and one of the things that's really unique, you know, we have this proverbial embarrassment of riches that Ashish now just went through with you in NMIBC. Oh, and by the way, great updates here at AUA uh, starting this weekend on almost everything he presented to you, which is super exciting. Um, some data has already been earlier presented. You're going to see updates of, of further follow-up. So very exciting area. Um, the natofaragene feridenovic, it's one of its unique uh, aspects is it's only delivered every three months. From a, so for a schedule of events for certain patients, that might be particularly compelling. So um, and it comes frozen, so there is some timing in the thawing process that you have to be skilled in making sure the patient's in your clinic. And we see that in other, other therapies as well. Um, so here's our case, a 64-year-old patient. This could be, you know, a, a male or a female. A good performance status, two induction courses of BCG, uh, CIS and uh, recurrent CIS despite the two induction courses, doesn't want a cystectomy. Uh, that's offered. And so now I'll, I'll maybe, uh, Josh, I'll, I'll ask you here. So we have this, and, and everyone can see, we have pembrolizumab, uh, the, the Kino 57, the, the phase two, phase threes that were really, really brilliantly done with the coordination of the SUO Clinical Trials Consortium. You have now the recent approval of N803, uh, this super agonist that, 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 that has to be given concomitantly with BCG, but yet the response rates are, are, are really impressive. And then uh, Ashish now also showed the TAR200, the gemcitabine device, the TAR210, the, uh, the uh, FGFR3, and this oncolytic-like uh, uh, gene a vector with uh, the colgenesis cretostimogene. So the, these three are not yet approved, but so now t this week when we go back to our clinic, what are you gonna, what do you, how, do you, how do you talk about this? That's one of the questions that came up on the iPad. Yeah, and, and, and this is, you know, we're at the point where we have a lot of options, a lot more than we've had. I mean, previously, most of those patients in practicality would get 
a double chemotherapy option in our clinic. So they'd get gemcitabine, docetaxel, but after a discussion, right? So a discussion of with pembrolizumab, a discussion of adstildren, we're at the point where we're just getting it in our pharmacy. So we're going through the process of how we get it, how we give it. So I, I think figuring out which patient and sort of individualized care, but, but I think all of those are on the table. And, you know, luckily you're right. I'll come home from this meeting and I'll get people starting to show up with, you know, hey, I saw this was presented. Can we talk about this? And so I, I, I think knowing those decisions, but really it's going to be like what works for each patient and sort of what they're, like you say, if they live 20 miles from the city, they're not going to want to come for six weekly dosing. So at soldier may be the perfect thing for them. Uh, but, but again, we, we're just getting all that on board. I think that's a very good point, Neil, if I may, because, you know, people will often look at the data with uh, natafergine and say, well, it's only 23% at 12 months, but you recognize that early, right? So if a patient has a CR, you find that out at three months. So it's not like you wasted a whole year. You know at three months what's happening to that patient. And as we know, and this is Bladder Cancer Awareness Month, um, there's a large majority of patients in the United States that get no treatment, right? So we're talking about all this, you know, excess of riches for patients that have access, but there are so many patients that have no treatment at all. They're older, they have to tell their grandkids to take time off from work, and they can't to go to the doctor. So for those patients, it makes sense to say, hey, I have this drug that may not work as well as some of the others seem to be reported, but it's once every three months. Can you come? Let's see what happens. And of course, the other thing is, I don't think, and as a community, when a lot of these initial trials were, were designed, um, and again, you know, all, all uh, a credit to the companies and the FDA, but there were guardrails built in, right? So if a patient had no CR at three months, they had to come off study. That's how Pemero was designed, and that's how the natafergine was designed. But we've learned that you don't have to rush to a cystectomy at three months. You can offer something else to these patients. You could reinduce them, you could give them another drug, and the better results with some of these other agents might be because we've learned that we can do that reinduction. We can do more treatment. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. We don't have to jump from this doesn't work to a radical cystectomy. We do have choices. Well, that's a great comment, and I really appreciate it how we, you focused in your session on NMIBC on the high-risk, high-grade patients. So there's a whole other very huge epidemiologic uh, population in the, the low-grade, low-risk, intermediate risk, which is something that certainly needs to be further discussed. But you know, sort of augmenting what you also said, Ashish, and, and which is a great segue now into Josh's presentation, is by and large, most of our patients, I think north of 90%, if given their druthers, would like to avoid having their bladders removed unless they have very defunctional, problematic voiding uh, bladders. So, so with that, let's, let's uh, transition over to Dr. Meeks' presentation on trimodal bladder sparing. Great. And so, you know, the, the title of this is really trimodal, but, but really we're going to be talking about sort of all sort of new strategies and bladder preservations. And it begins with trimodal, but I think we're going to get into a lot of other sort of newer kind of cutting edge versions to, to potentially spare the bladder. And so just we should begin with trimodal. So trimodal uh, really it involves three folks, right? So it's involved us as surgeons, it involves medical oncologists, and obviously involves uh, radiation oncologists. And so we're the ones who are doing the, the diagnosis and the, and the resection. But I think in general, this has gone from something that was really meant to be for patients that couldn't get a cystectomy uh, or refused a cystectomy to really having equipoise with, with radical cystectomy. Unfortunately, there's no randomized trials to say one is better than another. I, you know, there was a randomized trial that closed early because patients essentially refused to have a cystectomy when they were randomized to it. But I, I don't think we need to say superiority here, but really we have two options for patients. And, and I think that's kind of how we approach it. There is some retrospective data, and this is all really propensity matched cohorts comparing similar patients with similar backgrounds you know, similar aggressive tumors. And, you know, some points of this study, you know, about a, a third of them had more advanced disease, so they were not T2. And if you look at the overall survival and cancer-specific survival, if you select these patients appropriately, really there's no difference in OS and, and, and recurrence. So you can say that, you know, for the right patients, this is, this is exactly as good as a radical cystectomy. 
I think we go to the benefits on the other side of it. And really, you know, as a, as a beacon function, I'll say that beacon has really driven bladder sparing and bladder preservation. This is clearly a priority. When you look at quality of life through almost any validated questionnaire, the bladder that someone has after trimodal is a good functional bladder. And in many cases, patients with both self-image as well as the negative effects on cancer report superiority compared to radical cystectomy. One of the things about bladder preservation is that we've gotten better over time. You know, some of that relates to the techniques and, and how trimodal is done, but I think a lot of this really has to do with patient selection. So we're selecting patients better. So we really favor stage two cancers, really favor minimal carcinoma in situ. Maybe we're identifying CIS better. And, and really trying to identify patients that would do well with this. So these Kaplan-Meier curves, you can see the dark blue curves are the oldest, and those are five-year increments. Just over the last 15 years, you can see a significant improvement in how patients are doing, really mostly by, by patient selection. Now, when you talk to patients about trimodal, we say that you, know, you can have distant recurrence, so metastatic recurrence, but also you can have local and you can have muscle invasive recurrences. And those non-muscle ones are gonna be managed just like you would any other non-muscle invasive recurrence. But really you need a multidisciplinary team with diligent follow-up and, and good imaging. So just so, you know, not everybody performs trimodal therapy and, and really under, to understand at the nuts and bolts level what that is. So usually as the urologist, we're the ones who make a diagnosis and we say, well, you know, there are a lot of options for this. Um, what would you think about bladder preservation? And so when the patient's interested, that's really where the multidisciplinary team gets involved. So we as surgeons begin that discussion, but then we quickly try to coordinate with a medical oncologist and a radiation oncologist. They then, once they make that decision, they come, and while sort of they're doing the planning for the chemotherapy and the radiation, we'll usually go back to the operating room for a re-TUR. Now that doesn't have to be a maximal TUR where we're trying to resect to fat, but really just a re-TUR to really try and decrease the amount of bulk and the amount of cancer there. Most patients on that, on that will actually have no cancer present. So that, that really again suggests they're a good patient for trimodal. Then they'll go on and get trimodal and <clears throat> after that's done, they'll come back and see us at 12 weeks. And again, that's not a cystoscopy in an office. I usually bring those folks back to the operating room for another TUR. And that's really we say, where we say, did this work or did it not work? If they don't have any cancer present at all, obviously they're in good setting and they go on to get uh, surveillance. If they have muscle invasive disease, well, you've given it all, your, all you can, and really they should really consider a radical cystectomy. If they have non-muscle invasive disease, that's when we'll go on and do BCG or another form of intravesical therapy. So the trials are in this space are really beginning to push the envelope. And I have this as the first trial. This is SN1806. This is the SWOG trial. Uh, this was really the first one that began in 2018. Um, 475 patients were the goal. It actually fully accrued 484 and closed in February. And that was comparing trimodal therapy with trimodal therapy in atezolizumab. It was a relatively short course of Atezo, only nine cycles, but the primary endpoint is bladder intact disease-free survival or event-free survival. So that doesn't have a muscle invasive recurrence, no metastasis, bladder is intact and the patient didn't have a cystectomy. So that's kind of a new primary endpoint for, for trimodal and for bladder preservation. Again, that trial is completely closed to accrual and so we'll have follow-up from that probably the first of all of these. Um, coming right after that is Keynote 992, and so this is built in very similar manner as 1806, but with the difference of the patient's randomized apembrolizumab go on to get a year of therapy. And so again, same endpoint of bladder intact, event-free survival. This trial is open and accruing uh, and doing quite well, so I think this is going to come right after uh, SN1806 and likely give us information about more adjuvant therapy. Um, Dr. Kramat talked about using the TAR-200 device, and I think this is probably the first iteration in bladder preservation. This is a very patient-friendly trial 
uh, from the Janssen group. So this is Sunrise 2. So again, these are muscle invasive bladder cancer patients. And the standard of care arm is trimodal therapy, but the intervention arm is the TAR-200 device with citrelimab. And again, the goal of this is bladder preservation. And so this is, again, open, accruing, and I, I want to say this is probably about halfway accrued at this point. So we'll be very excited to see how the TAR-200 device, which really was developed for non-muscle invasive disease, is going to do in the muscle invasive setting. I think the next sort of steps are how far can we take bladder preservation with perioperative therapy? And really to start asking that question, I think you have to look at how does chemotherapy and immunotherapy do alone? So there was ver a number of relatively small phase two trials, so Pure One, Abacus, Nabucco. These were immunotherapy alone neoadjuvant trials, so patients got this treatment instead of chemotherapy. And if you look at the CR rates, those are between 30 and almost 50% in this setting. And then you can start adding chemotherapy to IO, and again, these are still smaller phase twos, getting response rates between 30 and around 40%. And I think, you know, that opens the door to larger phase three trials. You can see there's four large phase three trials comparing chemotherapy versus chemotherapy and immunotherapy. And many of these trials, the patients who got intervention got both chemotherapy and IO in the, in the beginning and then uh, went on to get IO for adjuvant therapy. So, you know, CA117, that's Gemsys and Nivolumab. Niagara, that trial's been closed for a bit, so that's 1,000 patients. So each one of those is almost 1,000. So Keynote 886, so Jim Sis and Pembro, and then B15, which is Pembro and, and, and Fort Mavidotin. Again, we know that that drug class is certainly reshaping how we take care of patients with bladder cancer. And the platinum el ineligible arm, obviously, right now our standard of care is nothing other than you know observation. So the bar is really low uh, to compare complete response or uh, event-free survival for patients on Keynote 905, that's Pembrolizumab and Infortimab, Volga, so that's triple therapy, so that's Dervalumab, Trimalumumab, the CTLA-4 inhibitor, and Infortimab, and obviously Sunrise 4, she's talked about, TARC-200 and Citrelimab. So all of those drugs are really meant to push the envelope to knock disease down and get patients to T0 or a complete response. So these two Kaplan-Meier curves you can see in, in purple here, these are those patients who get a CR and you can see, look, 10 years out, you're at 80% survival. But if you don't have a CR, that's really where we have a challenge. So all these drugs are really meant to push everyone from the green curve up to the purple curve. Now. What happens if people refuse local therapy? And we don't really have great trials, or we haven't had great trials. We've had patients that simply just go off the rails and they elect to just have no cystectomy. Retrospective data actually suggests that those patients don't do terrible, right? So these are folks, you know, 10-year overall survival, 75%, 73% compared to partial cystectomy and 65% compared to radical cystectomy. So we know that not everybody needs their bladder removed. So is there a way that we can actually build that into our, to our trials? And so this is probably the most forward-thinking trial that we've seen so far. This is the Hoosier GU16257 trial, 76 patients, muscle invasive, and they got a regimen that was Gemsys and Nivolumab in the neoadjuvant setting, and then they got reevaluated. So that response to the neoadjuvant setting was evaluated, and, and really it split the whole cohort into two. So roughly half the cohort did not have a complete response, and 34 of those 39 went on to get a cystectomy. But of the 33 patients that did have a complete response, you can see 32 of the 33 went on to keep their bladder and then got adjuvant nivolumab. And here's the swimmer's plot. You can see those patients. You know, they're three years out now. Really, there's only one of them you can see here that had metastasis. So this sort of makes sense, right, that if a patient has a complete response, based on all the stuff we talked about before where patients got a cystectomy, it's probably safe to watch these patients and they're being cured by their systemic therapy. And again, we actually think about the response to drug as a biomarker. So if you have a complete response, your biomarker is positive, and actually you'll do very well with metastasis-free and overall survival. And if you don't respond to these drugs, then clearly you have a different tumor and you likely need more. And so again, I think many of our trials will, will end up building on that. 
So what does this look like in 2024? And I think this is very different than like what our NCCN says, right? So diagnosis, get chemo, have your bladder removed, consider adjuvant therapy. I think this is going to be much more nuanced in the future. So when a patient comes in, there's a lot more things we can begin to use. So for example, we can use imaging. We can actually see the bulk of their cancer both inside and outside of their bladder. We can start using biomarkers. Are they pd well one positive? Will they respond to immunotherapy? Are they FGF receptor 3 positive? Can we use a TAR-210 device? You know, do they have a high TMB? Will they respond to IO? Will they respond to chemotherapy? And then that's when that decision making begins. What is a patient's goals? Do they want to keep their bladder? Are they willing to undergo surveillance? And I think that's really where this discussion is, is kind of going, is what is their, their safety? Many patients just won't want to undergo that risk. We don't have really mature data right now, but there's a lot of folks that would say, if there's a good chance that I could keep my bladder and stay alive, I want to do that. And that's really where we can begin to, again, apply biomarkers. So many of us are using circulating tumor DNA, Signatera, to follow patients and say, if you're clearly negative ahead of time, you may not need systemic therapy. So I think this is, again, becoming a much more nuanced discussion. Right now, we're sort of in the middle of, of figuring out the best way to apply these therapies. But I think this is a really exciting time for us and exciting time for our patients. Okay, that was that was wonderful. Um, yeah, I think there's when you think about the potential for trimodal bladder sparing, and oftentimes we talk about this vaunted notion of the multidisciplinary team. There's probably no better role than right at this moment. Whether you you know work with the, the urologist, the radiation oncologist, the medical oncologist, your imaging, uh, your pathologist. One of the things that uh, you know maybe I'd love you to comment on it was asked in the question, uh, Josh, is the role of what's maximal TURBT and how important is that in these trimodal bladder sparing regimens? Well, sir, there there is data from the uh, bladder preservation community that patients who get a re-TUR do better than those who don't. So, so I, I usually recommend it for patients that, if possible at all, that they get another TURBT. First of all, that's often the first time I get to take a look at their bladder because they were usually diagnosed and they come and see us. So that, that's one option. But I think the biggest thing when you're doing those TURs, I usually use blue light because I want to know if they have carcinoma in situ because many times the trimodal will work for the muscle invasive component, but then they're left with CIS. So I think that's really helpful. So, so identifying where that CIS is and how much they have, trying to quantitate that I think is helpful. But for the depth of the TUR, you know, again, it's a biomarker. So the more cancer they have, the harder it's going to be to cure them with any kind of therapy, let alone trimodal. So I generally try to resect a visual completion, but clearly if it's, you know, if it's not going to, if it's pushing through the bladder wall, the light, if they have hydronephrosis, it's a much harder case. And, you know, that's really where I would consider neoadjuvant chemotherapy for these folks. I mean, and again, it's given a lot more across the world is, diagnosis, neoadjuvant chemotherapy, if they get downstaging to T2, then, then that's really where the trimodal will come in. So, so I, I've tried to incorporate systemic therapy before TMT, and, and I, I think that really can kind of downstage those really aggressive big tumors. Yeah, we're going to talk about biomarkers later. I'm really glad you brought up the whole notion about m molecular tumor markers and the Signatera, because I use that too, not yet incorporated into the guidelines, but... Um, that's a really interesting area, isn't it? In addition to landmark analyses that you presented, but maybe any additional thoughts on, on circulating tumor DNA? Yeah, so I'll try to get that pulled on a patient when they come see me with a muscle invasive diagnosis, because it takes a few weeks to get that data back. But I think in general, if they're Signatera positive, then generally they're gonna have much more aggressive cancer. Many of them are gonna have metastasis. It's not 100% will have metastasis, but clearly they have more advanced disease. And I think systemic therapy, if they can get it, clearly plays a role. So we'll, we'll definitely try and get that for them. A quick question, kind of going back to your session, uh, Ashish, I think it's a good one, is how much training is needed for, and we, we also see this in, in, in bladder sparing with the, the, the Sunrise uh, 2 trial, uh, how much training is needed for the urologist to learn proper placement of the TAR-200 or the TAR-210? Uh, I'll answer that, but if I could have your permission and just respond to the TUR. Just with a show of hands, could I see how many in the audience are from, um, not from North America, overseas? 
Okay. The, the reason I bring that up is because in the UK, where they do a lot more radiation for bladder cancer, um, there's the bladder path trial that has gotten a lot of attention. And the paradigm has shifted. They don't do a TUR, right? And this is Jim Caddo, Nick James, Ananya Chaudhary. I mean, they have been doing trimodal therapy for much longer than we've even thought about it in the US, um, with due respect to Bill uh, Shipley. Uh, so the paradigm in overseas is look in the bladder, see a tumor, do a biopsy, prove it's bladder cancer or not, even to use cytology and go straight to radiation therapy. And the reason that trial has been reported as positive because the end point of that study was can we get our patients to treatment early rather than the six to nine to 12 month delay in the UK system from when the patient is seen to where they got to anybody's books. But that trial was reported as positive, but the positive nature or the end point was can I get them to treatment early, right? But because of that, it has become kind of standard in, in, in uh, the UK and other places to not do a TUR at all, to leave a bulky tumor in the bladder and go straight to chemo radiation. Um, they use either GEM or 5-FU or whatever is, uh, or mitomycin at their center. And they're reporting results that are just as good as not doing a TUR. So I just wanted to bring that up in context. I still do exactly what you said. I use optical enhanced technology, blue light, yeah. go in, try yeah. to resect all the tumor. And, and, and in my experience in these trials, 992, Sunrise 2, I'm, I'm resecting down to fat. I mean, I'm trying to really debulk as best I can, but I, yeah. Yeah, but there was a fa paradigm. Fascinating, yeah, yeah, yeah. Very disruptive to, to leave it behind and say it's gonna work as well because we, it's not within our, our, our concepts. Right, I mean, they flip around and tell us, well, you don't do a prostatectomy before you radiate the prostate, so why are you doing a TUR before you radiate the bladder? And, and I just look at them and I'm, I say, never mind, right? Uh, uh, what was the other question? How much it, it, experience it, it, is needed? Yeah, to, to place the, the TAR 200 and 210. I, I think short answer to that is any urologist that's gone through first two years of residency can do it. It's like putting in a stent. It's simpler than putting in a stent. It's not complicated at all. Thanks. All right, so here's our, our case for you, uh, Josh, to, to tee it off. 65-year-old, uh, male or female here. Again, we're, you know, uh, so CT scan is unremarkable, no lymphadenopathy, no visceral metastases. Uh, there's thickening in the left lateral wall, resection's done, it's, it's a T2 lesion. Um, there's no hydronephrosis, obviously. Good performance status. You know, what's the conversation now that's happening at, at your tumor board? Yeah, so again, I, I think the discussion begins with the patient of, do you like your bladder? I mean, are you happy with your bladder now? If you could keep your bladder safely, um, is that something that you would consider? And so, you know, our, previously the standard of care in the U.S. Is, is chemotherapy and bladder removal, but I think bladder preservation is a great option for many people. Let me tell you what that involves. And so, you know, these are who you have to meet with. This is what surveillance looks like. What would your thought be to keep an eye on this for two years? And again, a lot of people, the unknown and the uncertainty of it is too much for them. And they say, you know, I, I'm just, I'd rather have it out. But, it, but I think that's really the discussion and it's really a patient driven discussion. Yeah, I, I, I agree. And so now we've got to this point in NMIBC and trimodal bladder versus full or radical cystectomy of having this sort of vaunted, important shared decision making of all these different things. And, as, and, and very importantly, as you said earlier, Ashish, and as you said too, a theme in trimodal bladder, high grade, high risk NMIBC is if the treatment that you first choose isn't necessarily working well and you're following patients diligently, uh, you can move to something else. And, and, and so I think that is one of the key things, uh, rather than just trying the same old, same all the time. Okay, so um, uh, let's go over to advanced stage disease. Um, and as, as everybody can see here, there's so many amazing trials. And one of the things that Beacon does a really good job of is trying to help uh, push uh, sites that aren't doing clinical trials, other organizations, IBCG, uh, SUO, um, yeah, uh, uh, LUGPA, AUA are all trying to really, we, we have to galvanize uh, sites that are not conducting trials to start conducting trials. Because sometimes we say we have more trials available than we have quality trial sites. So I, I really implore everyone to, to get into the, the mode of, of trials. 
So let's talk about adjuvant muscle invasive bladder cancer trials. And so interestingly, and I'm, I'm going to go through these fairly quickly, we had the Invigor uh, uh, 010, which essentially looked at a one-to-one -one randomization of atezolizumab versus observation in patients who had high-risk disease post-radical cystectomy. Uh, and you see the disease-free survival endpoint, a whole bunch of key secondary endpoints. Now that was the first large phase three prospective trial that looked at adjuvant checkpoint inhibition, and it was a failed trial. So it didn't meet its endpoint. So we could have said, well, okay, well, I guess this just doesn't work. But then lo and behold, now we have a Checkmate 274, which was a, a fairly similar trial in patients. Some had had neoadjuvant platinum-based therapy, some did not, um, fairly well balanced. Uh, and similarly in the ambassador trial, and similarly, PD expression was also um, interrogated. Um, the nivolumab trial with the Checkmate 274 is to really be um, applauded, Dean Bajorn, first author here. This was FDA approved as the first adjuvant strategy of a checkpoint IO therapy uh, in August of 2021. Uh, and then most recently, the ambassador looking at pembrolizumab uh, also had a positive readout. Uh, OS is still very mature. I'll show you some of the data on that. But here's the Checkmate 274. And looking at the intent to treat population, if we look at on the y-axis, the disease-free survival, uh, curve separating really early versus, you know, a placebo infusion with nivolumab, which is given every two weeks. Uh, and you can look at the various uh, landmark analyses at two years, three years, and really now you know, pushing out further, and you see a doubling in the disease-free survival, a, a, a doubling, 22 at the median to 10 or 11 months. Uh, so rather Im impressive. A particularly impressive uh, result in terms of the, the particular assay that uh, they use there for, for PDL1 expression. So a really higher response, six times longer than uh, compared to placebo. So these are the patients who've gotten through their cystectomy. They have high risk features, larger, uh, larger, uh, uh, bulkier disease. Uh, even some um, potential pelvic nodes. And these are patients who can really benefit um, dramatically what, rather than waiting for them to develop um, first-line uh, uh, metastatic disease. Um, and then we look at the, the interim OS, which is getting more and more mature. You see the data points out to three years and beyond. Uh, clearly with uh, you know, trending very favorably, and in particularly in the patients who were interrogated for PD expression. We'll talk about that and how often you're doing it right now in your clinic, um, and I'm gonna ask the faculty how often they're doing it as well, what, and what tests are they ordering. So the ambassador was just uh, recently presented. This just came out in ASCO GU this year by Andrea Apollo at, at, at NIH. A real a positive study, very similar trial design. One sees the, 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 the median DFS benefit, the hazard ratio, very similar, approximately 0 0.69, 0 0.7, or earlier in the, the 274, but still very early, so you can't make any conclusions on, uh, on overall survival. So but the thing this is really important for all of us who are doing cystectomies to have that really uh, full-throated conversation with patients at your tumor boards. Now, what about improving the daily management? So these are, have all been historically, the checkpoint inhibition treatments have all been given intravenously, whether it's on a two-week, three-week, or sometimes a six-week regimen. So that does require chair time. It does require a knowledge of the immune-related adverse events. But here's a slide that's up here, and I think this probably speaks a lot more to uro-oncologists, but even medical oncologists, and here's why. Subcutaneous administration, why would that have benefit as opposed to intravenous? Well, um, you, you, you no longer have the issue of intravenous access. Some of our patients, right, you just kind of big, thick arms. You, they can't find a vein. You can't even draw their blood, let alone give them an infusional therapy. They may not want to have a port placed. Uh, and so 
a subcutaneous administration, whether it's in the abdomen or in the thigh, and we're looking at all of these different locations, offers a great deal of flexibility, not to mention throughput in your clinic. You're not tying up an infusion chair, you're coming in, quick administration, the, the administration times are dramatically decreased. And if you are doing a lot of infusion, you're opening up those infusion, op those uh, uh, chairs and or your, your rooms for additional infusion use, even if it's an intravesical therapy. So what you see on the far right is the, um, in Europe, uh, subcutaneous atizolizumab has been approved in Europe for, um, uh, it was studied in non-small uh, lung cancer. Um, we have some uh, additional uh, work that's being demonstrated for sub-Q nivolumab in, in renal cell cancer. Um, that was some data that was recently presented and that very positive in terms of efficacy. But you really decrease the administration time. And as for all of us, we recognize throughput is important. I don't care if you're, what country you're in, um, a clinic, rural, metropolitan, urban, community, academic, we have a, an aging population, more bladder cancer, a paucity, a supply chain issue of medical oncologists, uro-oncologists, radiation oncologists. We have to become more efficient. So I'm actually very intrigued by the sub-Q. In my clinic, we don't have this issue. We give intravenous, but I could see where the sub-Q opportunities would be beneficial. In the BCG Naive, there's a phase three trial known as the CREST trial. That's fully completed. That's a subcutaneous administration for patients with BCG um, uh, uh, Naive uh, who have high-risk disease. Uh, and then you see other uh, opportunities combining with an LAG3 inhibitor, uh, relitolumab. We're actually studying that in, in kidney cancer in our research center, but this is being also used as a subcutaneous NEVO in metastatic melanoma. So one of the things that we've been talking about since 2016 are the unique immune-related adverse events. And basically, these are sort of the kind of the foremost common, but essentially is you can get an itis, which I think is a Greek suffix for inflammation. And this is how I describe it to patients. I say the lymphatic system, the immune system goes everywhere in the body. So head to toe, you name it, you can get an inflammatory response. These are the four key ones, but you could in way, way less than 1% get an encephalitis, a thyroiditis, a pneumonitis, a pancreatitis, elevated transaminases, or a hepatitis, more of a, a lab chemical, a colitis, uh, and certainly a dermatitis. Patients really get that. I say that in a very short window of time. The key is recognizing it and calling us, calling me or my, one of my nurses, and actually trying to avoid going to the emergency room, the emergency department where they're not really well equipped to understand that. And then you need to have a working knowledge of the varying grade one, grade two, grade three, fours. And essentially, whenever in doubt, stop therapy and start steroids. I mean, it is ultimately that simplistic. There are some other issues for grade three, fours around severe colitis and a myocarditis. Again, the myocarditis less than 0.001%. Here's sort of a timeline for when you would see these immune-related adverse events. Now, I'm really kind of encouraging this for my uro-oncology colleagues, especially uh, where they may have a challenge with their medical oncologist. If you have a medical oncologist who you're working hand in glove with, fabulous, that's great. But if you wanna take this on, you can do it with the right support team and it make it more efficient for your patients. This just gives you some sort of a guidance on the timing of when you may see some of these. The liver toxicity, is it really, it's, it's mostly transaminitis. Um, endocrinopathies, the things we do see a lot of are both hypothyroidism and hyperthyroidism. Having your endocrinologist available is great. You can order a thyroid panel, easy to do. You can order an amylase for pancreas um, and, or a light, as light paste as well. These are not challenging things to do. And you broaden also your multidisciplinary team with your gastroenterologist, perhaps your dermatologist. But again, it's usually stopping your IO infusion and starting high dose steroids. So let me stop with a case, and we'll stop with that first half of my presentation and go to a case. We have a 56-year-old athletic uh, woman. She's a runner. She does marathons. Um, and now she's had, you know, several months of on and off blood in the urine. So she, did, she went on to Dr. Google, and she says, oh, I've got runner's hematuria. I'm going to ignore this. She goes to her family physician, and he says, oh, it's a urinary tract infection. Here's antibiotic, and more delay, delay, delay. And we see this. 
Uh, we as urologists know that blood in the urinary tract, especially painless blood, is cancer till proven otherwise and has to be looked into. So a cystoscopy is uh, undertaken. It's got a sessile mass in the anterior bladder wall, diagnosed with muscle invasive disease. Now, interestingly, maybe it was because of all of her running and ill-fitting shoes. Um, you know, and we can talk about what are the best shoes to wear to run. She doesn't have neuropathy. She has, uh, doesn't have hearing loss. She's otherwise fit. She's got normal renal function uh, by, based on creatinine clearance. She's treated with four cycles of gem cysts, kind of that classic paradigm, and she's followed by a cystectomy and a neobladder. Everything goes smoothly. She gets it done at a high volume center, uh, probably Northwestern or MD Anderson, so she gets in and out really quickly. She's got a T3B. She's got, well, we could debate whether or not what you would do differently if she had one or two or three or four lymph nodes versus no lymph nodes positive. So would adjuvant IO be appropriate for this patient? Let me start with you, Ashish. You see so many patients like this at your tumor board. How's the dialogue going? So um, I'll be very candid with you and, and with this audience. The dialogue on the surgical side is rather different than the dialogue on the medical oncology side when it comes to adjuvant IO, at least at MD Anderson. So the way I approach it is, you know, I have a honest, frank discussion with the patient. This is what we would have done in the past. This is what the data has now. We have DFS data. We don't have overall survival data. And what I do is I do send um, the Signatera. Right, because I really like the way Tom Powell's has shown that if you have persistent positive, you say it was positive before or not, but if it's positive afterwards, this is a patient that's likely, very likely to develop frank metastatic disease because there's already circling tumor cells. So my counseling of the patient is yes, I would recommend adjuvant IO if it were me. And um, then what happens is when we send them to the medical oncology side, and if any of my colleagues in the room that say this in a public forum, especially now with EV Pembro being so effective, the discussion has changed to say, well, we don't have overall survival data with the IO, so why don't we just go on observation, and if you develop metastatic disease, we have this really effective therapy that includes IO. So it's change, right? So uh, from a surgical side, because we put this patient through neoadjuvant therapy, we put her, in this case, through a major operation, the thought process is, uh, why stop halfway? We have drugs that have shown activity, there is DFS data, let's get the appropriate test and let's finish the, the story that we started. Um, but it's not something that's standard. So let me respond then, I want to hear what you say, Josh. Uh, so, so I get the Signatera and I absolutely, and if I get repeat scanning, and if the scanning's negative and the Signatera is positive, I absolutely recommend adjuvant, but I even recommend adjuvant if the Signatera is negative. And I, well, I recommend it, but I have that shared decision-making conversation. I really go through very carefully the 10 to 15% risk of a grade three, four adverse, immune-related adverse event. It's 10 to 15%. That's what all the analyses show on virtually all the checkpoint inhibitors. And I say, you know, you have to make this decision. What would I do if it were me? Uh, I, this is what I, I typically, I say, I, I would go for that given, the, you know, if you get a reaction, we can stop. I don't typically go into, oh, by the way, you'll if you develop you know, metastatic disease, we have some additional great treatments for you, but I get the provocative nature of, of that response, but Josh. Yeah, very similar to what you would say. I, I don't think we have data that the biomarker can guide treatment yet, right? So that's the modern study, and if you have it open, that's a great study asking that question. If they're positive, you know, it's a randomized trial of two drugs versus one. If it's negative, it's observation versus treatment. So hopefully that'll answer that question. But in reality, you know, the patient would meet Checkmate 274 criteria, and I would say that probably the standard of care, we have a 35 to 40% improvement in recurrence for you. So generally, I would draw Signatera, and they would probably start treatment, and if they have adverse events and, and their Natera is negative, then we'd probably consider stopping it. But if it's positive, then clearly. But I think this patient's kind of borderline, but, I, but we, you know, we're at the point now where we have some data, but I think 10 years, we'll, we'll know what to do with them. Yeah, a question came up here. I'll just answer it real quickly. The positive OS data from 274. Absolutely. So that's where I, I push Nevo, and I've been pushing it really now for the last three years for my adjuvant patients uh, who are appropriate candidates. Uh, what can urology clinics do to better recognize and manage immune-related adverse events, uh, especially if sub-Q comes into it? It's a great question. Uh, we're working a lot with AUA. We're working with SUO. We're working with Beacon. We're working with LUGPA. Um, 
I, you know, there are courses here as we speak. There are courses at EAU. There are courses that you know, one can avail oneself to. I think you, if you're going to have your advanced bladder cancer clinic, there's no doubt that IO is going to be front and center part of it. And even if you're not administering it and you're working with a medoc and you have a great relationship, and I think that's fabulous, you need to still be aware of what those IRAEs are. This is not, uh, 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 this should not be an, uh, an impediment for entry for euro oncologists. What would you say would be for those starting of all these settings, non muscle, muscle, metastatic disease, what's a good window to begin treatment if you're, if you're just starting? Would you say? I think given today, where we are today with the approved label, I think uh, looking at PEMBRO and, and BCG on responsive CIS is a really good, because these patients you know, tend to be you know, younger, m less comorbidities and fit. Uh, I think that's a great way to start outside of doing clinical trials. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, the tools to support patients. Patients are savvy now. This is, you know, I, I you know, Full disclosure, I've had the privilege of being part of Beacon since its inception and, and, and being on the board. Uh, I'll be s cycling off. It's been an incredible experience. This is a really, uh, uh, folks who get onto this, um, Seth Lerner's been on the board, um, and, and Cheryl Lee at Ohio State, and Gary Steinberg's been on the scientific committee. Um, it's been a real honor and, and a pleasure because they're really doing great work for society, and a lot of this is also available outside of the U.S. Their website is exceptional for educational tools. It's like they do great work in funding research and have an annual think tank and really promote our, uh, some of our most talented residents and fellows to go into the field of bladder cancer research and education. So the team collaboration progress, uh, we, we've talked a lot about this. You know, it, it's, it's like the heterogeneity of bladder cancer and the heterogeneity of prostate cancer. There's the heterogeneity of how you practice you, where you are and what your relationships are with all those folks that you see that typically on that, those, those, those pie charts of all the different stakeholders. And you have to individualize it to what works for you. Get the right people in the room with the right culture and the right leadership, and then you'll have a winning formula. So let me just get into what, 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 what Ashish has already uh, alluded to, and this came at uh, ESMO at 2023. And these are just two you know, record-setting, game-changing uh, therapeutic trials uh, that have now led to you know, the further use of checkpoint inhibition, uh, one is uh, now with the, uh, the, the 901, the Checkmate 901, with a traditional gem cyst platinum-based chemotherapy with nivolumab, and then the, the 302, which is uh, infortimab bedotin, an antibody drug conjugate, uh, which is basically working at the level of nectin-4, which is ubiquitously expressed, and has an MMAE uh, payload with pembrolizumab. Now, of note, we had some earlier studies at the very top, which didn't lead to that we're not successful, but that's why we do trials. We continue to do trials to change clinical care. And these two trials, if you haven't become familiar with them, uh, the Checkmate 901 and the EV302 are just massive game-changing opportunities for you to really be at the state of the art for first-line metastatic urothelial cancer. I'll go over them really quickly. So here's the, the Checkmate 901, and you're gonna see some updated information presented on this um, by Guru Subhamade on the, the nodal patients, which is really provocative. I can't go over that right now, but basically you're looking at patients with uh, for first-line um, uh, metastatic urothelial cancer who received Nevo plus gem cis as opposed to just gem cis alone, sort of a standard of care treatment. Uh, and ultimately you see the overall survival uh, uh, benefit on the, the left and the progression-free survival benefit on the right. This was a New England paper by uh, Hyderden and was, um, has, has now been incorporated into the guidelines. I think one of the things that's really interesting about this is that, and when I show you the 302 data, which is Pembro and Infortimab Vidotin, this antibody drug conjugate, and we're not doing, I'm not going to do cross comparator trials, but look at how, what some of the issues are, much like everything else we've talked about today, in terms of the adverse events, the administration, who will give it, how to give it and what patients will uh, want. And, and the look at, and I think what's gonna be really interesting is some of the subgroup analyses that are coming forward. 
Um, and so when you look at the objective response rates, and this was done with a blinded independent central review, as all these trials invariably are. Saturday uh, here, uh, Guru Sampavade is going to present some additional subgroup analyses, uh, in particular on lymph node patients. Very, very intriguing data. But ultimately, what you see here is, is not only the response rates, the, the complete responses, the partial responses, besting gem cis, the standard of care, uh, and also the, the strong duration of response. Uh, tornado plots are really important to look at. The dark blue here really signifying the grade three and higher. Yes, you can see some myelosuppression. Um, of course, you can see that with both of these drugs. Uh, combinations really probably coming more from the gem cis, 18, 22%. Um, you do see a little bit more on uh, the uh, uh, um, uh, on um, on th thrombocytopenia, uh, but overall, when you look at the differences, they're they're not overall that striking. Uh, and I think that that's an, a really important thing to see. No new immune-related adverse events that we hadn't seen in previous nivolumab trials. Let's go over to the 302. This was uh, on the same podium, same stage at, as, as ESMO 2023 this year, presented by Tom Pals. And one can see in the therapeutic arm of EV and Pembro versus um, platinum-based therapy, the stark difference in the hazard ratio of 0.47 on overall survival, uh, as well as a hazard ratio of 0.45 on progression-free survival. Curve separating, you know, really pretty early. And this, we frankly had never seen these kind of survival and progression-free responses uh, previously. It was really a rather, uh, you know, uh, amazing moment to see this. And then also, ultimately, a New England paper, and now in the guidelines. So one can also see here now the response rates, Show, showed you that for the 901, um, and the differences, again, also blinded independent central review. Looking at the um, tornado plot here of the adverse events, the thing that you're going to see more of here, because both EV and Pembro can cause rash, and EV in particular can cause neuropathy. And that should not be a barrier to entry. I think it's important that we as a field uh, learn a lot more about to assess for baseline neuropathy and then seek a subsequent evaluation for patients who can um, develop neuropathy. There are tools that are being um, developed and stay tuned for that. You, you need to be aware that other things cause neuropathy obviously all the time, di diabetes, uh, maybe, you know, chronic uh, exercise uh, done poorly, et cetera, many, many different things. But these newer drugs have um, uh, uh, results on, on, on neuronal implications. So other things that are really important, we have uh, already approved. It has an accelerated approval, and that's Cezatuzumab, Govitekin. Um, this is a, approved. This has got uh, a, another opportunity in, in for second and third line patients with metastatic urothelial carcinoma. Um, you see the objective response rates, the duration of response, uh, different um, toxicity profile compared to infortimab vedotin. And then just before we got here, the FDA approved a tumor agnostic indication for HER2 positive patients. So that includes patients uh, with bladder cancer. So I think this is really important. And then that really speaks to uh, the notion around testing. I'll go through this pretty quickly right here because uh, Ashish already spoke to it. Um, I test, and I've been testing regularly with the next generation sequencing because I wanted to find patients who had FGFR um, uh, alterations because I think it was in 2019 we saw the approval of oral uh, erdafitinib. Um, this is the only oral antineoplastic bladder cancer agent that is available. And this was based on really great work done by Jonathan Rosenberg. Uh, but ultimately, there's some other studies. I'll show you the Thor uh, trials here in a second. But uh, looking at a large database in the Flatiron, which is a U.S. database with greater than 700 eligible patients, showed fewer than half had undergone testing, fewer than half. And these Flatiron is 95% is medical oncologists. 
And I personally feel this is an enormous area of unmet need in the urologic community where we're not taking, we're not leveraging uh, genetic testing, not only in bladder cancer, but also in prostate cancer. But those that did get tested, 21% had an FGFR alteration, and only 42% received an FDA-approved drug that prolonged survival. So that's clearly kind of shame on us. So this is a busy slide. You can read through this. Just a quick an a question I'll ask you, you both right now. Um, I've been getting... Um, for my bladder cancer patients, all my muscle invasive and all my metastatic bladder cancer patients, I've be get, been getting uh, 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 tumor uh, NGS on all of them since 2017, 2000, yeah, I think 2017. Is there ever a patient where you don't get that at Northwestern or, or MD Anderson? Um, no, we, we, we get it on everybody. Uh, we have our own internal panel, and it's supported actually by uh, philanthropic uh, support to MD Anderson, so the patients, um, if it's not covered, it's, it's, it is covered. Okay, so I have to, I have to use commercial, but I get, so your answer is zero percent don't get it, so 100 percent get it. Northwestern? Yeah, it's hard to say. I'd say, you know, after, if, they be, if they're metastatic, they're, they're likely going to get it. We've had so few targets, and even though ERT has been effective, it, where it fits into this, it's hard to say. Getting it now from the urine in our non-muscle invasive patients more as MRD rather than actionable targets, but, but there are actionable targets now, and so th that data is really pretty sh exciting. Yeah, so you saw that data in flat iron for a medical oncologist. It's infinitely worse for urologists, but this is, this is going to change dramatically, right? So, so I, I think that's sort of the, the take home here. So here's Erda. This was the Thor trial. Yeah, they had these, you know, these were for patients getting monotherapy. They had two different cohorts, uh, a prior treatment with an, a, a PDL versus no prior treatment with a PDL, the difference in cohorts one and two. Vinflunine is a, 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 a chemotherapeutic, very popular in the UK and some other parts of Europe, not approved in the US. And you see the different randomizations. Uh, at the end of the day, now given systemically through an oral administration, not like the TAR-210 that Ashish told you about, the ertafitinib in the releasing device, this is given systemically, uh, but with this, these patients had a marked improvement, not only in, 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 in their progression-free survival, but look at their overall survival benefit, the curve on the left. So you have targeted therapy, biomarkers selected, why you need to do testing. And it's not just with FGFR. You want to be know, learning about MSI high and, and, and tumor mutation basis as well and, and other, other uh, alterations that are coming forward. Um, here, just quickly, the response rates of the patients. You got ERDA versus chemo. It's pretty impressive, and as well, even the PRs. Now, it does have some toxicities, and you can kind of read through these. I did the earlier trials. I've used this drug on label. It, it, it is another issue. It, you've got to do some baseline retinal evaluations. You can use an optometrist or an ophthalmologist. There are some skin and nail toxicities. You need to uh, monitor phosphate levels. Um, but it, it's certainly an option for patients who've progressed and it's an oral-based therapy, so in some ways they may interpret it as, 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 as easier than, an, than a, a parenteral therapy, but it is specifically biomarker-related, so I think it's really a, a very nice option for patients, in, in, certainly in third line. So here's our case, 66-year-old hematuria, bladder mass, cytology, TORBT, um, reveals a you know, muscle-invasive disease, multiple nodes, um, abdominal and pelvic, good renal function, smoker, not surprising, has grade two neuropathy, no hearing loss, uh, otherwise, and you get testing and there's no FGFR alterations. So I think, you know, this is a case where, you know, how do we think about, you know, we have this, again, I, I know it's sort of hackneyed to keep saying it, but we have an embarrassment of riches. We just had two incredible phase three trials that are changing the paradigm, the 901 and the 302. So how do you make your decisions? So you look at patients' performance status, you look at their comorbidities, you look at you know, uh, opportunities. Um, thoughts on, you, just how about just neuropathy in general? Where do you think we're going with that? Ashish, I'll let you answer that. Yeah, no, I, I, 
I was thinking, I mean, that's a very important thing, right? Because we, we sometimes don't uh, factor that in when we're talking about patients, but we have patients who are musicians, they're dependent on their fingertips really for, for their livelihood sometimes. And we take that for granted a little bit. So I think that's a very important point that you brought up. And the fact that this patient has great two neuropathy would clearly inform what choices you offer the patient. I think the other thing to keep in mind is that even though the EV PEMRA data is, is so superior to anything else we've ever seen and you know, actually led to a standing ovation at, at, uh, for Tom Powell's, um, ex access to drugs is not always the same in different parts of the world. And um, just for the show of hands, there were a few people from overseas and I see some more have trickled in. It's not available in many parts of the world, right? So we have it here, but in many places, uh, if this patient wasn't here, we'd, we'd essentially be using Gemsys Nevo. Yeah, and that's okay, right? And this is, this is great. This gives us this really nice opportunity to present patients with array of treatment options. Um, Josh, any? Yeah, no, I, I, but I, and I think we're gonna start getting to the question of deintensification, right? So, you know, even though this is EVP, it's still cytotoxic chemo followed by checkpoint maintenance. Really, I mean, that's really what we're doing. So I think once you achieve that response and those nodes will likely respond, um, then the question will be like, when can you pull that off safely for patients and just have yeah. them on checkpoint? Yeah. Well, I, I love that you brought up the notion around deintensification because I think that's really important as it relates to quality of life issues. And you know, hitting patients hard who have a biologically lethal disease, if they get a really great response, can we do further biomarker analyses and give them a time to you know, have their treatment interruption or their treatment holiday? I think that's an incredibly exciting um, uh, notion throughout all of oncologic care. So I think we're, we've done really well on time. Um, any other questions we'll take? And we have one question up here. Considering the prolonged duration of complete response with Checkmate 901, would this regimen be preferred for cisplatinum eligible uh, patients? Well, I, I think that that certainly is a, it's an important consideration. Um, I think the 901 is 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 you know, is a landmark uh, uh, paper, and uh, now that it's in the guidelines and, and has full approval, uh, I think we'll have you have to have that full throated shared decision making conversation regarding that versus uh, using an antibody drug conjugate in the form of infortimab vidotin. Now, keep in mind that, you know, we're gonna to start to see a lot more of these uh, antibody drug conjugates uh, that are gonna be tested, it's, and, and we're gonna to start to see, uh, and Josh showed you some of that in the EV304, these, these neoadjuvant strategies. I mean, they're even looking at some antibody drug conjugates in the bladder. So um, I, I think it's, 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 it's an exciting time. It's constantly evolving in terms of the data that's been published, the data that's getting presented. As she showed you a tremendous amount of data that's gonna be presented within the next hour after you leave this meeting. So, and, the, and some data presented tomorrow. So it's, I, I think it's a great time to be involved in bladder cancer. Uh, we have numerous new classes of agents with distinct novel mechanisms of action. Unfortunately, there's never a free lunch. There's always some new adverse event or implementation issue, and we have to surmount that to the benefit and the betterment of our patients. Testing, being biomarker selected or a tumor agnostic, it's important to be up to speed. We just learned about HER2 positivity. Again, another reason to be, to be checking and offering a patient uh, an option when they have a very dreaded biological uh, disease. Um, so uh, I, I think you know, there are certain things that we as urologists can do on our own and we can do completely with 100% comfort I think urologists should be uh, you know, leading the, the, the orchestra or the quarterbacks on the team for a large, especially for newly diagnosed. Uh, and, but ultimately, uh, I'll conclude by saying um, the time is now for you to have your advanced bladder cancer clinic. We can learn in the community a tremendous amount of what's happened in our academic centers, such as MD Anderson and Northwestern. Gentlemen, any final parting words or thoughts? Um, no, just to echo what you said, right? I mean, Bladder Cancer Awareness Month, um, there's a lot of uh, new and updated data being presented at AUA. 
Uh, take some time, visit the Beacon uh, website, see what you can do to help your patients. There's a lot of resources for our patients on that website that you have access to com you know, free of charge. You just have to download it and print it. So echo your sentiments there. Yeah, yeah really well done. Thank you. I mean, an exciting time for our patients. Okay. All right. Well, everybody, thank you very much for your time. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash DME860. This activity is supported through educational grants from Bristol Myers Squibb, Faring Pharmaceuticals Incorporated, and Janssen Biotech Incorporated, administered by Janssen Scientific Affairs LLC, which are both Johnson & Johnson companies. This activity is certified by PVI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education. This activity is developed with our educational partner, the Bladder Cancer Advocacy Network. Remember to download the slides and practice aids.